Today we're going to be talking about dyslexia and digital design. This is an AbilityNet webinar. We do webinars regularly around accessibility topics. Last week was Dyslexia Awareness Week in the UK and we ran a couple of sessions for Dyslexia Awareness Week. This is one that just bumped into the next week. We couldn't run too many last week, but it's a topic that's particularly important to us in our work and um, we thought it would be good to include it in the mix. I'm going to start by asking you where you are in the world. I just want to make sure again that the software is working, but also just to see who's out there. Um, you should have a poll up now asking you whether you're in the UK, other parts of Europe, Asia or North America. Uh, it's always useful for us to know who's out there. So if you could click on that, I can see what proportions of people have um, clicked through. Great. And primarily you're in the UK, it's saying. Which, I, which is what I'd expect. Um, so I'll uh, close that poll now and just share the results. You just show 95% of people in the UK. So I know that software is working. We'll ask a couple of other questions as we go along in a minute. So um, uh, the um, somebody's just asking about SlideShare. SlideShare is slideshare.net slash ability net and you should find slideshows up there. Today's will only be up there after this event, but last week's events are up there now. Um, somebody's just asking about one that they attended. But slideshare.net slash ability net will get you onto the slideshows. Great. So today we're going to be talking about dyslexia and digital design. And I've got uh, two colleagues from AbilityNet with me uh, on the call. I've got Joe Chidzik. Uh, hi, Joe. Are you out there? Just check your lessons. Hi, Mark. Yep, yeah, I'm here. Hi, Joe, can you tell me what your job is at, at AbilityNet? Sure. So I'm a usability and accessibility consultant and my role is split between reviewing websites and applications for accessibility, but also going in and talking to the different groups who have involvement in development of websites from designers, developers and, and writers and advising them on how they can end up with a, an accessible end product. Great, thank you. And you, um, we're going to talk about this today, but you work on site within client teams as well um, as a particular part of your work. Yeah, that's right. So I'll often sit down with a particular group depending on what stage of development an application is at. So it might be the design is in the very early stages, towards the latter half of a project it might be working with developers or authors and you know, I, I can sit down and work with them in a team through the design and development process to iron out issues as they arise and give them advice relating to accessibility. Right, brilliant, thank you. And Robin, hi Robin, are you, are you out hi, there? I am. Good, good. And can you tell us what your role is, Robin? So yes, thanks. I'm Head of Digital Inclusion at AbilityNet, and that involves talking to, pretty much similar to, uh, to Joe, talking to uh, organisations, uh, corporate sector, public sector, government, central government, etc. I'm going to be lobbying an MP this afternoon, all about accessibility. So a lot of public speaking, a lot of advocacy to try and push this agenda forward to make sure that um, we get uh, an improvement in the quite lamentable situation at the moment when it comes to uh, website accessibility. Great, thank you. And I'm the marketing manager and I coordinate uh, the webinars across a range of different topics within AbilityNet. So dyslexia and digital design, six million reasons to think about digital design um, and, get, uh, and get it sorted. Um, there are six million people in the UK estimated to have some form of uh, dyslexia. Four million of those are considered to have uh, to have some, some severe effect on their on their lives in terms of their uh, reading or their writing capability. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Um, a, a theme today really is about uh, 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 using a user-centered approach is going to address lots and lots of issues in terms of putting together a, a, a dyslexic friendly digital design. But also we're going to just touch briefly and we'll mention I think as we go along the business case for why you need to get this right. Six million is a very reasonable proportion of most people's customer base and um, as much as 10% of the population. So uh, as well as making your site accessible and any legal or social reasons, there, there, is, a, there is a good case here for, for, for making this work. Um, we're also going to be talking about it being a multi-platform issue. Um, a few years ago, we might have talked about um, desktop design and doing things on paper. Clearly, we've moved a long, long way from that. But part of the challenge now, I think, is being able to work across multiple devices, multiple um, digital tools. Uh, there's a difference between creating an app and creating a, a, a mobile-based um, web content, for example. 
So we're going to talk about that a little bit and we'll welcome questions around those sorts of topics because it's the sort of thing I know that people um, are beginning to sort of try and grapple with. We're going to be looking at some of the issues faced by people with dyslexia, just so that you understand what it is that you're trying to design for, and then some of the design challenges that present and some of the common solutions. So as practical as we can be, please do use the questions um, panel down the right-hand side on your control panel to ask questions, but equally we welcome people's suggestions and top tips. We want to make this as interactive as possible. Brief note about what AbilityNet does. We are a charity. We provide a range of services uh, around accessibility, uh, enabling people to make their content accessible. Uh, customers include Barclays, Microsoft, the FA, Samsung, BT, and IBM. And we also did all the testing for the London 2012 Olympics and Paralympics. And although that's two years ago, we're still very proud of that. We do testing, we do audits, we do consultancy, we do accreditation. We also do training, and hence some of the content of this um, sort of session will be repeated when we're working with clients. We have other services for free services for disabled people. We have a tool called My Computer My Way, which shows you all the accessibility features in every mainstream operating system. And we work with BT to uh, set up and run the Tech for Good Awards. So Robin, over to you first. Can you give us a definition um, of dyslexia? Tell us more about what it is. Thanks, Mark. So up on the slide there, we've got, for example, what Wikipedia has to say about what dyslexia is. Um, I'm not going to read that out because at AbilityNet, we're not so much concerned with diagnoses, you know, formal diagnosis of a particular condition, but rather about the practical impact that it has on an individual and how we can overcome those difficulties, those challenges with adaptations, tweaks to software, their, their system, uh, specialist software, uh, or hardware, etc. Um, so I think the main thing to dispel here is that dyslexia isn't a learning disability. It's nothing to do with intellectual capacity. It's a learning difficulty, um, sometimes called specific learning difficulty. And uh, but as I say, it's nothing to do with um, how bright somebody is. And actually, people with dyslexia often are prized for their problem solving. Uh, capabilities because of the way that the brain is wired um, it actually makes them really good people to have in a tight spot so for example NASA with all of their shuttle crews one of those seven people would always have dyslexia so that that particular skill set would be available in a tight spot so it is the most common learning difficulty as uh, Mark mentioned earlier 10% of the um, population which is absolutely huge and moreover although this isn't to do with dyslexia but the same sort of things that we're going to talk about would help this group as well 25% uh, a quarter of the UK population has a sub 14 year age uh, literacy age so reading age so um, you know the very very similar uh, impacts on them and what we're going to be talking about would help them too there are other difficulties in this um, area, this family of uh, issues, and that's like dyspraxia, that's more to do with coordination, um, dyscalculia, which is more to do with numbers, uh, dysgraphia, which isn't on there, but that's to do with um, difficulties in, in handwriting or drawing specifically. So that hopefully gives you an overview of uh, the area and the audience. Thank you, Robin. And um, I mean, what, what, what's interesting, I think, when we've been preparing these notes is, is thinking about the impact and particularly from the design point of view. Um, obviously, there's an immediate impact on the individual trying to use your service. We talked about the business case. And this is really about thinking about what they're able to do um, in terms of using your service. But can you briefly describe um, the, the, the three areas there? We've mentioned reading comprehension, time needed. Could you explain what the impact is? and uh, why it arises. So reading, obviously, um, there are issues to do with uh, both reading and spelling. Um, often people have no problem at all in understanding orally, you know, hearing something and understanding it, but reading it um, is uh, much more of a challenge. Sometimes they know exactly what they want to say, but putting it down on paper is a real problem. So from a comprehension point of view, getting it down on paper is very problematic and getting it off paper when you're trying to read um, has you know, very specific comprehension difficulties. And we'll look at some of those practical implications uh, a little bit later on. Uh, there's also an issue with timing, um, time-dependent functionality, uh, whether it's a carousel or how long you got to fill out a form, etc. And again, we'll touch upon those a little bit later on. 
the main thing to remember here is that accessibility isn't just for disabled people, it's not just for people with dyslexia. Actually, if you look at what um, accessibility good practice is, is kind of forcing you to do, the end product after you've um, got to grips with the accessibility of your website or your app, etc., um, it will actually give you better usability all round. So you'll have a much better um, usability or, or kind of user experience because you've um, incorporated accessibility best practice in what you do, particularly with mobile where people are accessing the content in quite extreme environments. There will be some specific uh, issues to do with dyslexia. Um, you might want to include some special functionality that's aimed directly at people with dyslexia that we'll mention. Um, but 90% of what we're going to talk about will improve usability more generally and everybody will, will benefit from it. Great, thank you. And um, just to emphasize that, we've got a slide just talking about um, who needs to know about this stuff. and. Um, when we were putting the materials together, we, we came up with three different sort of areas, the content creation, um, the designers who are looking at graphics, look and feel, navigation and so on, and the developers are actually producing the code. That's a, a rough cut of the sort of team that we may expect to be working on any digital project these days. I think that um, it, it's always a team effort anyway, but in particular around digital, that's becoming more and more true. Um, and then equally looking at what we're talking about, just to define that uh, a little bit, websites, i.e. The, the various ways that we access content that's on the web, from a desktop and a laptop or a tablet or a mobile phone, um, those all have you know, different angles to them in terms of thinking about the issues for content design and development. Um, apps, which are, uh, e equally have their own um, sets of rules about how they're developed and the guidelines that come with them from the various um, platforms that you're putting them on. But then also documents, um, what, what we once would have called desktop publishing often produces content or Word documents, you know, word processing documents that end up as PDFs and are a key part of how people access your services or the services you're providing. Um, and equally, those need to be considered. And then a final area, which I think is very important for people to consider, is just guidelines, internal guidelines. Um, some of our clients we've been talking to recently are beginning to embed this best practice in their guidelines within across their teams, not just within the development team or the design team, for example. So at this moment, I just I just wanted to launch a poll. I'm going to ask you which of these areas is of most interest to you. Um, I, do you see, see yourself in this mix as a designer? Do you see yourself as a developer? Do you have a direct role in content creation or thought, an, an author role? Um, are you a marketing person thinking about commissioning this sort of service and needing to make sure it works for you? And I've left an other, and please do use the question uh, box to tell me any other you think is worth of note, um, just so that we get a sense of, uh, you know, what, what the mix is. Um, actually, it's fascinating. That's coming out really quite evenly across those three areas at the moment. So, uh, yes, please do use the, uh, the box. I've got a software tester here saying that they're an other. Um, but if you've got uh, any particular others that you want to mention, it would be very helpful for us to know. Um, I've got most of the votes in now. I'll keep it going for another few seconds. Um, education provider is another other. Um, great. I work in the same team as a comms team. and So you work with this, the, the comms team. That's interesting. That's sort of around the content creation, potentially, I guess, or the commissioning. Um, project manager, survey team. Great, a good mix there, thank you. I'm gonna close the poll and share it with you. And you can see that um, the biggest number is actually people involved in content creation, um, by which we're thinking about people putting content onto the site. That could be video, it could be uh, text, it could be images. Um, and then a reasonable proportion of people in designing or developing the actual code for that. And, then, and a smaller number, 10% represents at the moment, I think about 12 people on the call so um, you know a reasonable number of people involved in marketing as well as potentially being in other roles of course so yes I really want to emphasize that it's about a team effort uh, and then also one of the challenges with dyslexia is it's about trying to put yourself in your customers shoes which is quite difficult um, if you don't have dyslexia it's it's something which you it's hard to understand we've picked out a couple of examples here just to give you something you can go and look at later we're not going to go through this in any detail um, now, but there is a simulation at WebAIM. I will just jump over and show you what it looks like on the website. 
because it's interactive. So I'm now on the website webaim.org slash simulation slash dyslexia dash sim dot html. And uh, it will just show you um, some of the examples of how it's experienced. Uh, and then it gives you a little exercise to run through where it changes the letter order, gives you a minute to read it and then go back and you ask some asks you some comprehension questions about the text that you're reading. So that's a fairly simple way of trying to put yourself in those people's shoes. Um, we've also on our YouTube channel just posted up something we found in our archives, uh, which is somebody from our team going through a number of tools that just show you uh, the wavy pages and the letters moving around and lots of different um, phenomena that people with dyslexia may experience when they're looking at, at text um, that I think is interesting. It's only a minute and a half long, so you may want to go and look at that. And then, Joe, you were mentioning yesterday, I think this is something you said that your clients often use. Is I, it, it's, it's not a scientific test, I don't think. I, having looked at it myself, I think it provides lots of different useful pieces of information. You can put a URL into it, and it will tell you how readable the page is. So it isn't about dyslexia. Oh, sorry. It isn't about dyslexia specifically. Um, it is about readability. But there are some factors in there that... Um, what might be interesting in terms of trying to get your head around what what the um, uh, what the um, what a person with dyslexia is seeing when they look at your screen. These links will all be linkable within the um, uh, slideshow that will be shared at the end. So um, if you haven't seen the uh, if you haven't got hold of the, the links there, don't worry, it will, they will be in the slideshow at the end uh, that will be shared around. So let's start with the first area. We're going to look at these two areas broadly. One is editorial and the other is design. Um, it's important from a design point of view, and, and clearly looking at the mix of the people on the call, that we think about the content and how it's presented to people. Um, Joe, can I ask you a little bit about this? I mean, the structure and the content and the vocabulary um, don't rely, I'm, I'm just going to read that, edit and organize the content carefully. In terms of the context, don't rely on the content of the page only. You may want to offer downloads or printed versions. Um, and then in terms of vocabulary, you need to clarity and careful use of language. I think if you're producing content, you, you may well know some of these rules about dyslexia, or you may be aware that there's some things to consider. But how does that mix with the designers' work? Do they, you know, presumably they work with the authors to try and make this work best on the screen. Um, in your experience, when do you talk to the authors about their content? Thanks, Mark. So, yeah, there, there is quite a bit of crossover between uh, the design side and the producing content as well, I think. Now, I mean, what one example that springs to mind whilst a, a content author is going to be writing the content for your website, a designer will have some control over the look and feel of that in terms of the the, the choice of fonts, the typography, the, the word spacing and so on. Now, one of the first items on this slide, we've got uh, organizing content and structure. And it's, it's very useful for, for all users, not just dyslexic users, to structure content on a page, by which I mean make good use of headings, use lists appropriately, and that just helps prevent you having like a wall of text, which can be, you know, it can put any user off, but particularly a user who's got reading difficulties, if they come across a page and it's just non-stop text, no break in it, it's going to be very overwhelming. So whilst a, an author can put those headings together, it's really the, up to the designer to make sure those headings stand out and are easily distinguishable from the surrounding text. That's generally done by making the text a bit larger so you, a user can skim read it. Mark's also mentioned about the, the uh, advantage of offering downloads and printed versions. Some users will prefer to print content on different colored paper, which can make it more readable. So that's often an off-white bit of paper, light green, light blue, or a pastel shade. And it just gives them that flexibility. I mean, j just to expand on that a little bit, it, it's often good practice to, especially when you're talking about difficult or, or complicated concepts to provide that information in a variety of means. That can be via text, which an author can write, but it, it can also be via video or animation or, or some other method, which might be somewhere another place where a designer gets involved as well, trying to communicate a concept or idea via a different medium. And just on the third point here regarding vocabulary, it's, it's always important to write for your audience, so, so know your intended audience who's going to be reading your website and then try and tailor your writing to them. 
So, you know, don't don't overuse jargon or terminology that users might not be familiar with. But also, don't use 20 words where one word will do. You know, it's, it, it makes sense just to make the content as as easy to read as possible for users on the website. You might want to provide a glossary if you are explaining difficult terms to people, and that that means they can look those words up while they're reading. But but it's um. Yeah, it's good, good practice just to be aware of, of the audience and you can do that by involving stakeholders in the design process, asking them questions, getting them to proofread early content and so on. Great, thank you. And, and yeah, just to underline, it, uh, this is before we even begin about talking about literally the design, it's really about the process of getting the content and everything to line up. Um, but looking more at design, this is where we're talking more about look and feel. Um, the fonts, the colours and the layout. Um, in terms of the fonts, you need to consider the style, style and size. And, and um, you were saying, uh, Joe, that I think I don't, I, I'm not involved in the development side, but I think you have to disable pinch zoom deliberately. Um, so if you if you you have people who are disabling it, thinking that it's not helpful, but actually it is quite useful in this case to enable the size of the fonts to be increased. Um, is that right? Is that the right way around? You have to turn it yeah, off. That, that's in, entirely right. So, so often in my work, I find that the pinch zoom functionality has been disabled from mobile websites um, for whatever reason. Either, either it just hasn't been re-enabled as part of the development process, it's been overlooked, um, or it's to make sure that the, the look and feel of the site can't change. But actually, pinch zoom is, is a widely used feature, not just for people with a visual impairment who might find it difficult to read text because it's very small, but also people with reading difficulty will find it easier to zoom in and make, make small print easier to read. So it's a very simple solution, pinch zoom, and all it requires is that you don't disable it during development. So it's, it's a very easy thing to toggle on and off during development, make sure you don't accidentally leave it off when you're you know, making your website go live. Yeah, I think that's a useful one. It, it reminded me that we we talked in other webinars about uh, designers not being aware of the built-in options that people will use um, in many operating systems, and there there are we've done we've done webinars about that about the accessibility options that are built in, um, and it's a very good example. And, and presumably the same is true with color that you can control the color uh, across the operating system using various preferences. But this is more about how you design it up front, isn't it? This is just making sure the readability and legibility is there for everybody. Um, the colours thing, I think, it, it, it feels like something that everybody should benefit from to, for, it, for it to be as legible as possible. Um, so, and then finally the layout and, and uh, making best use of white space, making sure that line spacing is, con is, is good and there's a consistent navigation. Um, it, in terms of the navigation, particularly, uh, Joe, I just wondered if this was something that w where does this fit in the mix between the designer and the content author and the developer? I mean, who typically would drive and make decisions about the, the navigation structure on a site in your experience? Uh, it's, it's interesting, actually. I think all those roles would have uh, be involved to, to some extent, including people who determine the structure of a site, information architects, but the you know designer would often influence how, how the navigation appears and a few comments on that. It... Oh. We appear to have lost Joe. <laughs> Just to explain, Joe's in Manchester, Robin's in London and I'm in Brighton, so he can't jump out and come onto my, my, my start easily. Uh, I'll keep going. I, uh, we were talking about giving the, the user control, and we just wanted to highlight one example. Um, I'm not going to click through to this, but I thoroughly recommend you have a look at this. There are a whole range of different settings that you can change on the Manchester City Council website. And um, they include lots of things that would help people with dyslexia in terms of changing the line spacing, changing the font size, changing some of the color schemes that you can use. Um, it's an extreme version, I think, of giving the user complete control of the interface. It still works within the brand and other issues that designers will have to grapple with. But it's a very good example of um, uh, adding extra controls that the user will take control of um, without predetermining what the setup is going to be. Um, so you can go to manchester.gov.uk and then you'll see the accessibility button right at the top and there's just loads of settings within that. Interestingly enough, they've foregone the um usual addition of those three A's, the um, sort of style switcher at the top of every page, 
um, they've got a nice big accessibility button at the top of every page, so you know, one would find one's way here. But a very typical application of uh, or implementation would be to have those three A's at the top, uh, one for sort of the normal color scheme or kind of theme, one for a dyslexia friendly with you know 120% font size, one and a half line spacing, um, sans serif font if you had any fonts with ser with serifs with twiddly tails. Um, and a sort of a beige background. And then the third A would be a high vis one, you know, white on black or yellow on dark blue, that sort of thing. Um, and that's just nice because you've got one click uh, to be able to implement those. But this is a very flexible, this is the sort of power users uh, style switcher. Yeah. And I think, I mean, we, if you go looking for information about dyslexia, you'll often find with it uh, lots of information associated with style sheets. And, and I think the reason we didn't pick up on that was because this is such a different way of looking at it, that giving your users control um, to the extent that they have in this site when you see it, is, uh, uh, we, you know, we, we would say that's, that's probably the direction to head. Um, not to say that they couldn't have used the, the double A's and the, and the style switches mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, they're, they're, it's they're, a Rolls Royce. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. And then, and we've mentioned um, designing um, around colours and layouts and so on. Um, but there's a, a load of other things as well which come up. Um, and so we've picked out three things here. So it's not only the look and feel. It's not only the use of fonts and colours. It's not only the layout on the page. But looking at where you're accepting user input, this is a slightly jargon way of looking at it. But particularly forms, for example, and how confusing they can be for any user. Um, but particularly looking at the impact for somebody with dyslexia in terms of the comp how, how easy it is to comprehend, how long the form is, and whether or not the error messages are, are, are as clear as they could be. All of those will have an impact on people with dyslexia trying to use your service, but you can imagine that any form would be improved by, by addressing those issues as well. Um, similarly, in terms of uh, the time it takes to fill a form out and how long before it automatically kicks you out, and that's an example of time dependent functionality where because people are taking longer to perform particular tasks because they they just need longer to comprehend what they're reading or to make decisions about which button they're going to press on and those sorts of things then you may be preventing people using your service by having them booted out too quickly in the time co in it which is a code level issue another area where you would often see that is a carousel that changes too quickly for people to read the information and not having a pause button. So good accessibility would allow you to have a, a carousel with images and text, as long as that text can be uh, read by a screen reader. But very often the carousel is moving too quickly for somebody to keep track of and doesn't have a pause button. Um, so those are simple changes which would help any user, um, as would the labels and on your forms and, and, and just making sure the layout of your forms is as clear as possible. And then back again that to saying don't forget the specific style sheet issues. Robin, you just mentioned those quickly. We haven't written them here. We can add them into the notes, but you can just, you, you talked about having 120% font size in this style sheet. Um, and some Yes, I mean, colors. this is what we would recommend for a, dis, you know, for a generic dyslexia friendly in quotes style sheet, uh, one and a half line spacing, 120% font size. That's assuming that your default font size isn't really mean. Um, you know, you should be looking at a generous font size equivalent to say 12, 10, 10 minimum. Um, and so 120% of that would be uh, relatively large um, or a generous font size anyway. A, a yellow or beige background uh, and making sure that you don't have any serifed fonts in your, uh, in your layout there. One quick point on the forms and the time controlled. It's not just that people with dyslexia um, take a little bit longer to, to read sometimes, which they do. And if you've got a lot of text within your form, then obviously that you know is a key factor. It's just that when you're filling out forms, getting the content that you're putting in accurate is absolutely vital. And everyone who know who feel, who's ever filled out a form on the internet knows that you know if you get it wrong, there could be horrible ramifications. So people with dyslexia will be checking their input over and over again for accuracy as well, and that takes time as well. They want to be really sure that what they're putting in hasn't got any errors or mistakes in, and you t typically don't have you know, a spell checking functionality um, available within a web form, for example, although there are um, there are solutions available. But uh, yeah, so you, know, you need to double the length of time that you would normally give, and I know that there are security issues with that, and you might have to have 
words with your um, IT security people, but you really need to have a very generous um, timeout on any form that you have. Okay, thank you. Robin, I've, I've switched over um, to the Coca-Cola website. A question came up about what is a carousel, so I thought I'd just explain it by showing that. A carousel is, that, is the jargon for the images that scroll through at the top of many websites at the moment. If I move my mouse away from it, it, it starts to time on and, and keeps going. If I, run my, if I want to look at a particular one, it hovers on that particular page so that I can stop and check which, which particular image I want to see. So that's a good example. It doesn't have a pause button, this one but it does enable me to choose which one I'm going to look at. Um, we would suggest it should have a, a pause button to allow you to play in the order, you know, to play and to stop it so that you can read um, what each caption is saying. So that's just to explain what a carousel is for those people who um, aren't familiar with the jargon. Um, so we've got a lot here about um, the design process and the, uh, the the things you need to think about. So one final stage really not, not to overlook is how important testing is. Um, if you're going to have a user-centered approach and you can see some of the issues that this is throwing up are not that simple to uh, understand, then you really do need to include users and um, testing within the process. It's vital for dyslexia in the sense that it's the only way you're really going to understand whether you've solved some of the issues uh, that you know are out there. Um, I don't know, Joe, are you there? Uh, I can see that you're actually yes. still on the call. You are there now. Yes, I am. Sorry. Right, thank you. So that's fine. Um, so I think when we were talking about this yesterday, we were talking about, uh, just in terms of the prep, about working across the team, obviously, and also when testing would be relevant, user testing in particular. Um, but if you could just talk to this, is I think this is really helpful for people to understand the actual, it's a team process here, I think. Yeah, so, so user testing uh, it, it is really a vital part of any, any development process. What, what I do as a consultant is I, I am consulted throughout the development process and I can have, uh, I can offer advice in the in the design stages when people are putting paper designs together, constructing uh, the structure of a website, writing content and so on. But user testing often gets uh, involved later on in the process once there is something to test. So there's a beta version of an app or an early version of a website that users can uh, be sat down with, ask to, to try and then a consultant like myself would, would moderate the testing and guide them through the process, asking questions and, and guiding them through the website or application, trying to, to elicit some, some useful feedback from that. Now, it can be useful to look for users, um, and particularly with dyslexia, which is a very common disability, find users within your organisation who might be able to help out with this. So dyslexic users who might be able to um, off their services and uh, and you know be used for testing websites and applications because they've got the advantage they might already be aware of the uh, the, the business area in which you work so it's not a learning process for them they, they can just give their opinions on how well a website works for them how readable it is and so on so you can do that you can source these users from inside your organization or it's a service that we can offer and you know we, we generally recruit from a large pool of testers with different um, degrees of severity of dyslexia and get them into our lab to carry out these tests. And as I said, that's generally towards the tail end of the development once I've been through and pinpointed a lot of the, the simpler issues and then we get the users in to, to really um, act as the fine tooth comb and pick up the, uh, the sort of key outstanding issues that I wouldn't be able to pick up as a consultant. So that's just a quick overview of, I guess, the user testing and at what points they get involved. Yeah, thank you. I'm just going to do a quick, there's a final little bit of poll. We're on the last little bits here. I just wondered how many people actually do testing within their projects, user testing or any other types of testing, but particularly user testing. Um, is this common? Is it something that you're already doing? Is it something you need to do more of? Um, so the answers are either not at all, some projects, all projects, not sure. There may be some examples you want to put in under the other um, uh, but it's useful for us to get an idea, I think, about we, uh, our take on it is that this is going to solve lots of issues around dyslexia because it's by doing the testing that you'll begin to understand the experience of the user. There isn't really another way of doing it. Um, 
So we've got, um, I shall close the poll, got to, uh, most people have voted. So the answer, I'll just share that with you, 50% of people um, have said that some projects have testing in, 18% not at all, and then a quarter of people, 23%, have all projects have some user testing involved in it, which is very encouraging. Um, great, so on to final slides, couple, last couple of things to wrap up, and then we'll have some questions from you. If you have any questions, please do post them in the box. Um, uh, on the side. Uh, some useful links. We've mentioned these as we go along. Um, the fact sheets uh, from AbilityNet you may not have heard about. We've got a dyslexia and computing fact sheet. That will give you some insight into the advice that people with dyslexia are being given around how to use computers and how to adapt them for their own usage. So if you're not familiar with, uh, if you don't have your own experience of dyslexia, that may give you some insight. And there are other top tips in there as well. There's also um, some uh, links from our uh, accessibility help pages that are uh, useful links in there. The web aim simulator, that's a good way of showing um, showing people without dyslexia some of the issues that people face. And um, you can then look at British Dyslexia Association as, as, has some resources on there. That's one of the most common places to start. And then I picked up a final one. We were found this yesterday and we were just talking about the fact that uh, this document from JISC that, uh, that produced in 2002 10 guidelines for improving accessibility for people with dyslexia, despite the fact that it's 12 years old, was still, we could easily have just lifted these 10 items and then dropped them into the bullet points that we've been doing. They still apply. There's some quite general rules in there that would be um, relevant now uh, as much as it was 12 years ago. Obviously, the difference in terms of the technologies may have moved along, but, the, but there are some general rules here which I think people could learn, and we would recommend that as a, as a good place to start. So uh, if you do have any questions, um, please use the questions box there. We've got about uh, five minutes uh, to, to answer any questions that you have. Um, got a few people posting a few things in. Um, th this is one. Um, uh, I'm just putting a couple together here. Uh, Joe, um, can I just ask you, um, in terms of working across platforms, do you tend to work within one team um, to look at both, say, apps and websites, and um, do do they get designed together, or do they get split up into separate parts when you're actually designing the, 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 the tools? Uh, I, I generally get involved in one or the other, to be honest. Uh, websites more often than not. When I'm looking at applications, at the design stage, for instance, it's, it's useful to review both iOS and Android applications together because the designs are often very similar visually, but how they behave can be quite different. So whilst I'll get involved in both both iOS and Android in the design stage together, it sort of branches off a bit after that in development and I'll review them separately. But generally I'll review websites and applications uh, as, as separate components, you know, for, for design development and um, content writing. Okay. It, I mean, does that answer the question? Or yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I think that it's a multi-platform world, and I think that, you know, any team trying to work out what they're going to do on an app and what they're going to do on a website um, is going to struggle, you know, because they're two different pieces of work. Um, and I think that the question was about really about how you manage across those different platforms. And, and I think that answers it, you know, it, it, it sort of depends on the project and where you are in the project. Um, there's a question here. I, I don't know whether to put, put, put both of you on the spot potentially, but do you have an example of a form that uses error messages well? Do we have one that we point out that we say, that's a good one? Mm. <laughs> As I said, I'm putting you on the spot here. But... Uh, not at hand, although while I'm talking, I'm just going to have a, a quick look because I, you know, there's a few good websites I know. I mean, in, in terms of forms and what information you need to provide to users, you know, it's important for users to know what information they're expected to input into a field, you know, their name, the format is, like date of birth, is it day, month, year, and so on. So it's vital to tell users up front what they need to do, but it's also just as important to tell the users where things have gone wrong. So if they've put in some incorrect information, don't just give them a very generic error message like you must fix the errors. Instead, tell them what they've done wrong. Uh, the date of birth field is empty. Um, your password does not have enough different characters in it and so on. All these are required fields. You must complete them before continuing. Th those are the sort of different facets of 
good form usability, I guess. I mean, Robin, have you any? Yeah, I mean, I would I'd be tempted to say Amazon. I mean, I'm a blind screen reader user, so I can't comment visually, but Amazon tends to do things really quite well, and obviously it's a form-heavy uh, site. Typically, with sort of the best practice approach to error handling is that you use um, in inline errors, so you, you clearly label next to the form field that is that has the issue and you can make that in red for example but you might also want to make it bold for people that can't discern color and you could have a similar um, error message at the top of the form below the sort of heading of the form again in red if there's more than one then you'd have more than one listed there and those would be what are called same page links so you'd have both and clicking that would take you down to the part of the form if it's a long form where the other error is repeated in line and so there's no doubt at all that you can find uh, your way to the part of the form that's got the error. Yeah. And, and I think um, forms is a really good one that, uh, that I certainly I've, I've picked up in, in, in preparing this um, webinar where you you know everybody knows how frustrating forms can be when they don't uh, communicate clearly with you about what they want from you when they don't give you enough time to fill them in, when they're not clear about what you've done wrong or tell you how to put it right. Um, so that's a, a really good example of, uh, of something that's good usability across the board um, that could potentially be solved by working um, and looking particularly at dyslexic um, uh, customers. Um, just one particular question about that. Uh, somebody said specifically, is it better to break the form into smaller ones or to have one long form? Is there, a, is there an example there of which of the two would work better? Generally speaking, breaking it down into steps is the better practice. Um, you know, Amazon, eBay, they don't have horrendously long forms, and it's clear that you know it's step one of four or whatever it might be, um, so that you're managing people's expectations. They've got an idea of how long it's going to take. Can they complete it in their coffee break, etc. And as you step through steps one, two, three, four, um, it clearly highlights which one you're on. You know, step three or four. Uh, all of that's good practice. Great, thank you. And um, final point then, uh, just because it's a more general accessibility point, which we've touched on as we went along. Is there value in having accessibility settings on your website when users can adjust their browser or other operating systems for themselves? What value can that add, I guess, is the question. Um, do either of you have a take so, on that? I don't want to steal all the, I don't know if Joe wants to. <laughs> no, go, go ahead. Uh, well, yeah, go, no, go Joe, ahead. please. Okay. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's an interesting question because there's definite value in people being able to apply that knowledge and how to increase the text size, how to change the colour scheme as they go from site to site rather than learning different methods of doing it on all these different sites. So, you know, you can just have instructions to tell users how to fine tune their browser. Um, that's that's probably the, the preferable way to do things. Now, you can you can point people at the, um, we've put together a My Computer My Way website, which does detail a lot of these instructions, how users can change their browser, Safari, Firefox, Chrome, etc., to meet their needs. So, you know, you can point people at a resource like that, which can be quite useful, and then they take that knowledge with them as they go from site to site. Uh, that said, I mean, did you want to have a talk about style sheets, Robin? Because, you know, we it can be useful to have alternative style sheets, can't it, as well? Yeah, we, I think we, you were, you dropped out when we were talking about that earlier. Ah, sorry, so, yes. Yeah. Okay. I mean, my take on it is that the best of both worlds would be to have a style switcher, because people don't have to click on that A, which is black with a you know, yellow background, um, but if they see it there, then it's one click away. Um, it, and it's for people that um, aren't as sophisticated as to be able to change their system settings. But the best of both worlds, as Joe said, would be have a style switcher and a, a very clearly signposted accessibility info page. And on there, you would either have what Manchester did, well, actually, that would only Im impact that site. So what ideally you'd have is a link to My Computer My Way or an alternative set of clear uh, guidelines that tell you how you can do things on a system level or on an application level, because My Computer My Way also covers Office and Internet Explorer and stuff like that, as well as system uh, preferences. And, 
and um, <laughs> somebody's just going. And um, then you can empower them to be able to make those changes so that they have a permanent um, impact on you know each website that they look at and on Office and on other applications too. Okay. I think I'll just add one more thing to that very quickly, if I can, Mark. That on, on the accessibility page that Robin mentioned, it's it's also an apologies if I, I dropped out. If this was covered earlier as well, but there's it, it's a really good place for uh, encouraging users to feedback with any difficulties they might have using your website, because we we talked about the importance of user testing, and if you can encourage users who have difficulty using your site to to get in touch with you and tell you what those problems are, you you've got a valuable source of information there in addressing those problems as they come in. So yeah, the that's really helpful. page is another place you can do that. That is helpful, Joe. That wasn't mentioned, so that's really great. Thank you. Um, I, I, actually, sorry, there is one more question here. I, again, just back to this thing about breaking the content up. There's a current trend towards the pages being very long and um, scrolling downwards. Um, do, that, do those pages work better, do you think, for, in terms of people with dyslexia using the content, or are you better breaking them up into smaller pages, and, you know, into other pages? That's something that you know. You see lots and lots of sites working that way these days. Any thoughts? We would probably want you to keep pages slim. Uh, you know, the, the rule of thumb to take copy from a printed page to the web is to halve the content, half the amount of content. Really strip it back. Um, we probably haven't mentioned the phrase plain English, but if you want a well laid out set of guidelines about how you can you know, editorially create content that is going to be easy to read for everybody, and that includes people with dyslexia, then if you just do a search for plain English, you'll, you'll find that set of guidelines. And that includes, you know, being very slim um, in the amount of content that you use. And that would lend to, uh, part of that is, is smaller pages uh, with less content on. Great. Um, I've got a couple of other questions, and I'm afraid we have to stop there. Um, uh, but uh, we can, uh, if you do want to get in touch, um, do drop us a line. Uh, Robin is robin.christofferson at abilitynet.org.uk. You can speak to us via our sales team, sales at abilitynet.org.uk. Please do ask any questions you have there that you don't think have been answered. They will make their way to me or to Robin, um, and we'll try and help with anything that you need help with. Um, we uh, have webinars regularly. The next one, uh, hopefully, will be the International Day of Disabled People, which is on the 3rd of December. We haven't quite decided what the topic is going to be yet, so keep an eye on abilitynet.org.uk slash webinars. And um, we will also be sending around notes from this and a link to a video and the slides for anybody uh, who wants to see it and also for anybody who couldn't be here today. That's, you can pass that on to them. So thank you for being us. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you very much, Robin. And uh, we hope you found it useful.